Welcome, colleagues, to the 169th uh, seminar in, uh, that CG has offered and uh, somewhere in the 40s, I think, in successive webinars. Um, and today we have the mischievous title of The Secret Life of International Student Recruitment Agents. Now, our very sensible presenters did not think of this mischievous title. I imposed it on them, so do forgive them uh, for, for the salacious title. Um, we're going to have two presentations, uh, but they're going to be collective, or the first one will be collective. And um, we'll first hear from Iona and uh, Enzo and Eddie, and then we'll hear from Pia, who's in New Zealand, and where it's 3 a.m. So we're very, very grateful for you, Pia. That is the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, and it just shows how hard we all work, doesn't it? You know, that we do these things, and we do these things for international connectedness, which is very important to all of us. Um, so let me uh, take you through the web webinar protocols. Um, those who are regular viewers will be used to this and may even be immune to the message. So let me let me advise you to listen. Um, the webinar will be uh, recorded and it'll be posted online. Usually it goes up within 24 hours, certainly within 48. Uh, and we'll also post the chat uh, which will be um, taking place during the webinar. Please keep yourself muted uh, unless you have been asked to speak or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but please do so when asking a question. We recommend using speaker view in Zoom so you can see more clearly who is talking at a given time. To ask a question, use the chat function. Uh, we compose the Q&A section on the basis of the questions that appear in writing in the chat. And it's advisable to post your question earlier rather than later. Question, some very interesting questions come in in the last five minutes and we find we've run out of time to consider them. When you're invited to ask a question during the Q&A, please unmute yourself. Now, I was chairing a webinar yesterday and three times I forgot to unmute myself. It is very silly. Um, so please, uh, please unmute yourself, switch on your video and state your name and where you are from. Now, let's pass into the webinar proper. And we're going to have in order Enzo, Iona and Eddie, I think. And so let me introduce them all briefly before we start and allow them then to pass to each other. Vincenzo uh, Ramo is a global higher education specialist who has held senior roles at Nottingham University and Reading. And he's co-author of a guide, Managing International Student Recruitment Agents, very pertinent to today's events. Iona, Iona Huang is a senior lecturer in management at Harper Adams University. And prior to joining HAU, she served as director of the Center for International Education at Edge Hill University and director of the International Student Center at Staffordshire University. It's a long bio and I'm turning many pages. Eddie, is, uh, Eddie West serves as assistant dean international strategy and programs at San Diego State University Global Campus where he provides leadership of international partnership development, collaborations, and overseas programs. And from 2016 to 2019, he was assistant dean international programs at Berkeley Extension, the continuing and professional education division of the University of California, Berkeley. So a delight uh, to hand over at this point to Enzo. Well, thanks Simon and to CGHE for hosting um, this web webinar today. Look, our aim today is to provide some insights into how universities and agents work to recruit international students. In particular, we hope to provide some analysis of approaches to contractual governance adopted by universities, some thoughts on how universities might achieve better results from their work with agents, and some findings about the effectiveness of national governance frameworks for international student recruitment. And I hope possibly some thoughts on whether national regulations might also be useful in countries where they do not presently exist, like the UK. But first, I'm going to give us some context, especially for those who might be new to the topic. So who or what are agents? 
Well, the UK Department for International Trade provides a description of agents as a person or entity which works on behalf of an exporter, in our case universities, introducing their products or services, degree courses, to potential clients, i.e. students. And it tells us that, that the agent is paid a percentage of the selling price. The Australian government provides a description specific to education by describing an international education agent as a business entity that has one or more agents acting as intermediaries between overseas students and education providers for the purposes of enrolling students in education institutions. We know that there are also educational counsellors or agents who are contracted by the student to support them in their application to overseas universities rather than by the university. We did not consider this type of agent in our studies, except in so far as they were also contracted by the university, i.e. paid by both the student and the university, what the Americans typically like to refer to as double dipping. Now, while the press often likes to report on dodgy agents, exploiting prospective students, falsifying qualifications and charging the university's commission for students who should never have been admitted in the first place, in my experience, the majority of agents are professional organisations who work hard to advise students on their options and support them with the often complicated process of applying to an overseas university, getting a visa and making travel accommodation and other agents. But why do universities work with agents? Well, among the reasons we were given by university staff is that agents are considered a quick way of getting students, because they fill a need, especially in countries regarded as unsafe for university staff travel. This was pre-COVID, by the way, because they provide a local um, market intelligence. And above all, they told us because agents are effective in helping them to meet their student recruitment targets. Now, while there are a variety of data sources for the number of students recruited through agents, we found no single reliable up-to-date comparative source. The most authoritative source we could find was at country level, and that's that published by the Australian government, which last year reported that 73% of all international students recruited in 2018 came via an agent. The New Zealand government talks about 50% of international students recruited through agents, but it doesn't provide anywhere near the same kind of detail or analysis as the Australians. There's no official national data on the use of agents for the UK, but various reports over the years suggest that at least a third of international students come through agents, we think more. Data for the USA is, is the most elusive, in part because the sector is so diverse and also because agent use has been and remains controversial in some quarters. But the Observatory on Borderless Higher Education reported 11% in 2014, and more recently Bridge Education reported that 22% of international students recruited to US, to US universities each year are recruited via an agent. What we do know is that nearly all universities in Australia, New Zealand and the UK and a growing number in the US work with agents. That some universities rely very heavily on agents to meet annual intake targets. You'll see from the chart there, one university, 90% of its intake came through agents. And the commission is typically between 12 and and 15% of the first year fee. So we know that agents are an incredibly important channel for international student recruitment, but how is that activity governed? In our study, we set out two key questions. Uh, the first is what are the contractual governance approaches adopted by different HEIs and how are those different approaches associated with the outcomes of those agency contractual relationships as perceived by HE managers? And at this point, I pass over to Iona. Iona? Yeah. Thank you very much, Enzo. Um, so I will have a look at our theoretical framework. Um, so Enzo showed earlier the relationship between university and agent is a typical principal agent relationship. Agency theory examines how efficiency can be achieved from the principal's perspective. The theory identifies two types of agency problems. One is partial goal conflicts or different ideas about how to achieve agreed outcomes. 
The other is information asymmetry, referring to pre-contractual hidden information or post-contractual hidden action. To mitigate the problems, the principal faces two types of agency costs. Firstly, to invest in information gathering and monitoring. And secondly, to incentivize the agents so that the goals are more aligned. Formal contracts have been used widely to address agency problems and costs. So this is the focus of our study. Our framework has four key components. Outcomes of the agency relationship, contractual governance, market power, and number of agents used by the HEI. Outcomes include effectiveness and efficiency of the contractor relationship. Effectiveness was measured with three indicators. O1, institutional satisfaction with the international student recruitment via, via agents. O2, satisfaction with the agent's behavior. O3, perceived control over agent's behavior. Efficiency was measured by conversion rate of student applications referred by agents. Contractual governance has been operationalized in many ways in previous studies. We focused on two dimensions, contractual specificity and the relation to contractual governance. Contractual specificity refers to level of explicitness and precision of the contractual terms. Related to this is the extensiveness of coordination terms, i.e. roles and the responsibilities, control terms, i.e. conditions and the restrictions, and within contract and monitoring terms. Relational contractual governance refers to the extent to which the contract represents the will of both parties and establishes mutual expectations and trust. Market power is self-reported entry standard compared to other HEIs in the country. We used a configurational rather than a linear approach to analyze the data. And data were collected through a questionnaire survey in three countries. The design of the questionnaire was informed by content analysis of 38 agency contracts collected from the three countries. We received valid responses from 86 institutions. Respondents were managers with responsibilities for international recruitment. So what are our findings? Our main finding is a typology of four archetypes. If we only use two key dimensions of the contractual governance, this is what the typology would look like. However, as shown previously, our framework is much more complex than this. Our, <clears throat> when we added other key variables, this is how the typology looks a bit of a challenge for me to explain all of this in a few minutes. So for those who are interested in the details, please do read the paper once it's online. We have actually created a simple version by showing the results in the four boxes with market power added at the bottom. I want to clarify a few things I may use short forms or codes for variables, so please do refer to the notations on the left of the diagram. And I also want to stress that a key feature of configuration approach is that a combination of conditions for high outcomes will be different from those for low levels of outcomes. But a particular condition could be in both. One outcome may result from several different combinations of conditions, and conditions can be core or peripheral. This diagram shows high outcomes in purple and low levels of outcomes in red. Of the four outcomes, we did not find 
consistent configurations for high satisfaction with recruitment O3 and high conversion rate O4. Therefore, you see only high O1 and O2 in purple, but low O1, O2, O3, and O4 in red. Our analysis generated four archetypes. They were labeled strategic hybrids in the green box, pragmatic operators in blue, flexible friends in yellow, and laser fair operators in pink. Institutions with low market power are only present in two archetypes in the right. Institutions with very high market power are not in the blue box. Due to time constraints, I will only take you through the green and the yellow boxes. Strategic hybrids in the green box are institutions with medium to very high market power. They use both high contractual specificity and high relational contractual governance. A combination of high use of these two approaches does not guarantee high outcomes. High outcomes O1 and O2 are coupled with additional core conditions of a high within contract monitoring terms and working with a low number of agents. Low outcomes are also present in this type, but associated with different additional conditions. Institutions with very high market power reported low perceived control and low conversion rate. For those with medium high power, low control was associated with a core condition of low monitoring, whilst low satisfaction with the agent's behavior was associated with a high contractual coordination. Flexible friends in the yellow box are institutions adopting high relational contractual governance, but low contractual specificity. They may or may not use a high number of agents. A high satisfaction with the agent's behavior O2 was reported by those with very high market power. High relational governance is a core condition in this case. For those with medium high market power, a high satisfaction with the agent's behavior was associated with a high number of agents and the core condition of a high monitoring. High control over agent's behavior was associated with the core condition of a high relational contractual governance, coupled with either a low number of agents or high within contract monitoring. Low perceived control O1, low satisfaction with recruitment via agents O3, and low conversion rate O4 were all associated with low contractual specificity and monitoring but O3 was only reported by those with medium high market power. On the right are pragmatic and the laissez faire operators. Laissez faire type only has consistent configurations for low outcomes. Eddie will expand on this along with conclusions. Great, thank you, Iona. Uh, so yes, one of the more striking findings of the research was that uh, laissez-faire operators had really the worst of all outcomes, uh, worst of all satisfaction with the results of their agent relationships. And in a way that finding was somewhat gratifying uh, to those of us who have worked in this space uh, because we tend to know that to be effective in working with agents, institutions really need to invest time in not just uh, vetting and onboarding their agent contractors, but in training them, in having multiple touch points, in visiting them, and vice versa, where viable, in ongoing and responsive communication. So, um, by contrast, those institutions that took a very hands-off approach who just sort of said, here's your contract, I'm going to hope for the best, uh, they tended to have the, the least of all uh, satisfactory outcomes. Uh, another point, uh, the second bullet on this slide related, uh, we found that a one-size-fits-all approach to agency contracts is really not advisable. And that's in part because of all of the different variables inherent 
in this activity, right? We talked about some of those earlier, uh, the basis of the research market power of an individual institution, which can vary widely within countries and across the world, number of agents that an individual HEI uh, contracts with, the strategy of that individual institution. So related to that, our, our third point there, um, the strong relational contractual governance seems to be a factor in successful relationships. And by that, we mean, again, to Iona's explanation, working with agents and engaging with them in the contracting process uh, so that there's real mutual understanding and mutual buy-in, really, um, to that, that contract and all of its terms. Uh, we know that uh, we in the, the researchers in the study uh, all live and work in countries that you can argue are far more legalistic, let's put it that way, than some of the countries that our partners operate in. And that sort of leads to this, this feeling as well that uh, working with agents to really understand what the contract is all about and the terms and the responsibilities is likely to lead to better results. And to that third point as well, um, this isn't across the board. It wasn't a finding that was consistent, but by and large, many institutions who work with a fewer number of agents tended to be more satisfied with the outcomes. And there's a certain stands to reason element of that, isn't there, in that if you've got a far flung network of hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of partners, much harder to manage, much harder to really have uh, tight relationships with each and every one of those. Uh, whereas if you have a smaller number of agents, uh, you can manage that activity a little bit more effectively. And then last on this slide, um, if you are working with lots and lots and lots of agents worldwide, uh, all the more important to ensure what uh, Iona refers to and our study refers to as contractual specificity. So specifying monitoring terms, specifying processes, again, specifying the respective responsibilities and um, obligations of each party to the contract. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, just some follow on observations from the study, uh, maybe this can give rise to some of the Q&A later, but uh, in the U UK and the US where Enzo, Iona and I respectively are based, uh, there's no national governance framework for international student recruitment to speak of. Uh, and because that's the case, uh, we would argue that the, the, the decision making about how to engage with agents and frankly, how to contract with them terms and the like uh, can really mitigate risk and optimize outcomes uh, for everyone if it's thoughtful, if it's strategic and if it's mutual, again, where the agent is bought in. Um, and by all stakeholders, I, I hasten to mention, we're talking not just agents and HEIs, but students as well. And to that segue to the next point, um, greater transparency in HEI agent relationships, we believe and would argue is long overdue. I know this is something that Iona and Enzo have advocated for uh, some many years now. And um, that's all the more true given the information asymmetries and the economic logic that does put students' welfare at risk. Um, we know that as Enzo pointed out, lots of agents are, fabulously professional and resolutely student-centered. We also know that some are less so. Uh, so more transparency would uh, help the environment in general. Um, the HEI and agent relationship is bilateral. Maybe another stands to reason comment, but our point here is that whereas in the past, there's been lots and lots of attention paid to agent conduct, agent misconduct, agent training, agent misinformation, et cetera. By contrast, there's not been commensurate attention paid to universities' responsibilities and universities' obligations and how to best ensure university personnel really understand the rules of the road and best practices in working with agents. Um, and we think that, that that balance ought to be better struck. Uh, the London Statement is a good example in this regard. Many on the call probably are familiar with the London Statement. The London Statement calls almost exclusively for agent conduct, agent dues, agent don'ts, don'ts and says very little to nothing about um, university responsibilities. 
Uh, last uh, point, uh, very top level, we would all argue that because of the pandemic and because those of us that work at universities that are accustomed to international travel are all indefinitely grounded, uh, we may see that more institutions either begin to work with agents, whereas in the past they have not, such as many institutions in the US, or intensify the existing activity that they engage in with agents. So. Uh, all the more reason we believe that uh, attention uh, is due uh, to this area. So with that, I am very happy to be able to um, turn the slides over to our good colleague in New Zealand, P. Tulia, who will talk a bit about what's going on in Australia and New Zealand uh, and some uh, follow on information there, uh, acknowledgements and contact. Uh, so thank you and P. Tulia. Thanks, Ed. Petulia is a um, senior lecturer in the Eastern Institute of Technology in New Zealand. She holds a doctorate in politics and international relations from Auckland. And most of her published research is on in the fields of higher education policy and management here. Great, thank you. Kia ora, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, and, and greetings from Hawke's Bay. Um, so today my presentation will be based on my most recent research looking at education agent regulation um, and in particular um, legislation in, in Australia um, and New Zealand. Um, so for those of you who might not be aware of the Australian and New Zealand higher education frameworks, um, Australia and New Zealand have been showing leadership at least in their legislation uh, space by introducing um, legislation. So Australia already the first um, legislation was actually in their very early 1990s um, and in New Zealand um, in the early 2000s. Um, I talk ab about providers. It's a term that we use quite a lot in Australia, New Zealand, um, and it does include other type of institutions as well. So not only universities, but I try to focus on the higher education institution um, sector more specifically. So I'll show you a little snippet of what the legislation actually looks like as well, um, but it does include both pre-arrival and post-arrival functions. So, um, so providers are asked to uh, meet certain criteria in their marketing, recruitment activities, as well as actually in service provision um, when the students have arrived. And when we actually look at the stated twin, um, goals of, of this legislation, um, it is explicitly stated that there is the goal of uh, protecting international students' rights, um, as well as the long-term sustainability of these very important export education systems as well. So um, some are probably more critical and say it's more of the latter, um, and international students' rights is just a way of uh, getting to the sustainability as well. And then there's also the important, obviously, interest to, to protect the integrity of the immigration system so that uh, the visa process is not subverted um, and the students that come in are genuine students as well. Um, and these Australian and New Zealand frameworks have been um, looked at by multiple academics, um, but most of these studies have been framework wide. So they have looked at all of these different standards, which means that there has been very little focus on, on education agent standards. Um, and I argue that these are probably, this is probably the most complex area of this legislation because it does include uh, third parties, especially when we think about um, the role of the government here. Um, and in the same way as um, my colleagues explained globally, um, in Australia and New Zealand, you would also hear that most stakeholders, most providers, government agencies, um, and so on would say that most agents are reliable partners. Um, so obviously, again, the issues we hear would usually be um, in, in a smaller part of the, the agent population rather than all agents as well. So I just want to acknowledge that as well. Um, what has been found is that a lot of Australian, well, a lot, but some Australian and New Zealand uh, providers have been found to have quite poor or very limited agent engagement and management practices. Um, and there have been incidents of agent misconduct, um, obviously in Australia and New Zealand, um, as in other countries as well. 
um, that have violated either the interest of international students. So this could be um, misleading information provided to student, uh, financial fraud, the document fraud and so on, or the interest of the governments, which could be also related to the non-genuine nature of the students or manipulation of documentation and so on. Um, so the government as a principle, again, in this government and higher education institution relationships really has to think about how they could reduce information asymmetries and, and better steer providers if they wanna take an active role um, in this domain. So these were the questions I asked in my paper. So I'm going to be very quickly um, touch basing on certain aspects of the long, longitudinal development of these um, agent standards, as well as the question, do they actually provide safeguards, especially when we look at international students' rights. And um, I already explained um, the agency uh, theory aspect of it, so I'm not going to go into more detail. I'm just saying that when we actually put the state or the government here, by the way, I'm uh, referring to uh, the federal government in Australia and the central government in, in New Zealand. Um, it brings another layer. So the more layers we have, the more information asymmetries we have. So for a government wanting to actually find out what an agent is doing, uh, there is a, a middle party there. Uh, so it makes it more difficult to actually find out. And then when we have a sub agent that the student might actually be communicating with finding information is, is even more uh, complex as well as there are uh, partially, only partially aligned interests as well between the different different parties. Um, um, so when we talk about the name of this session as the secret life of an education agent for the government, it might sometimes also be the sec secret life of the university or secret life of, of the higher education institution. So not necessarily uh, the agent only. So I started looking at um, the Australian and New Zealand um, agent standards from kind of late 1980s onwards. And the first ones I found were in the mid, kind of mid 1990s. Um, so where um, the government was trying to more actively steer provider behavior. Um, however, these first versions were um, pretty effective in terms of the content and the wording as well as, um, for example, the voluntary nature as well. Um, and then early 2000s is where we actually started to see more movement um, in this area. And to somehow evaluate um, you know, how well this legislation actually uh, meets good practice, I also tried to see you know, how is good practice defined um, in different agent management guidelines and documentation uh, by looking at different um, uh, published published guidelines. And so I found good practice dimensions for um, higher education institutions, as well as for agents, as well as, um, so um, Eddie already referred to the London Statement, which basically sets rules uh, for agents mainly. And here's just a sn snippet of how, how this legislation actually looks like for, for those of you who haven't haven't seen it before. Um, so um, this is from the Australian National Code uh, Standard 4. So you would see, you know, in 4.1, um, there is a requirement that all providers have to have a written agreement with each education agent, as well as then maintain details in this kind of government run database. And then in 4.2, it would actually go be pretty prescriptive actually explaining what type of aspect the contract has to include um, and so on. So just very quickly about the findings. Um, so um, both countries have um, moved from kind of these more voluntary codes to legally binding frameworks. Um, so in early 2000s and um, definitely it has strengthened um, and made more providers to be part of what I call maybe this minimum criteria um, that this legislation helps to provide. Um, and there is now and currently a wide array of different requirements for institutions uh, that they have to look at. So the early versions included limited number of um, areas that providers had to do, but it has been gradually 
basically um, extended. So now, I mean, there's um, requirements as as contracts, monitoring, corrective action and termination and so on. Um, and in legislation, Australia has already also been quite good in um, increasing transparency. Um, so requiring that all providers, for example, list all the agents they work with on their websites, as well as provide information directly to the government of the agents they work with as well. Um, and for agents ethical behavior, it has been mainly based on integrity, uh, quite often uh, based on um, aspects such as providing accurate information, uh, professional nature, and in Australia, transparency as well. So um, disclo disclosing conflicts of interest and so on to the student. There has obviously been other type of steering as well, not just legislation, including information provision in terms of, uh, for example, guidelines. Um, and there have been different government agencies obviously involved as well. So for example, in New Zealand, the Immigration New Zealand has been publishing um, agent visa acceptance rates publicly as well. So, so they have um, beyond the legislation improved transparency as well in, in certain aspects. There are a number of limitations, um, however. Um, so there is some missing content that's not included and it can be obviously debated if it would improve outcomes if it would. Um, so for example, financial arrangements, uh, any explicit requirement to train your agents um, is missing. Some of the wording is quite vague as well. You know, what does it mean when you have to take reasonable steps to something? Um, and these are quite reactive still. Um, so there's kind of this expectation that you have to take action if you become aware of issues rather than actually being accountable for, for good monitoring to make sure that any issues would be found out. Um, and there has been fairly limited compliance monitoring or penalties so, um, you know, the accountability is, is limited or has been limited uh, so far. And if you just look at what has happened uh, before, we can probably say that, you know, they're kind of more gradual um, improvement in the code content is the most likely way forward um, in, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, however, for, for this legislation to be really effective, the government would really, or argue would really need to do more direct monitoring of these agents uh, to really find out what's going on, as well as, you know, have some kind of a more explicit informant system, demerit scheme or something else in place. Um, there has been also a discussion as in the UK about the licensing schemes, uh, which might be um, something the government might be at some point interesting in considering. Um, however, we always have to think about, you know, the administrative burden and cost compared to does it actually improve practice? Is it just, you know, ticking a box? So, you know, what is what is the what are the good outcomes? Um, this is obviously a global marketplace of students. So agents might decide to start directing students to other destinations if Australia and New Zealand are very different from other countries in terms of the requirements. Um, and we could also see move to this um, as um, Enzo referred to this non-regulated consultants or student hired consultants instead of a provider hired, which basically means that they are not really regulated by anybody. So there are always questions of, um, you know, what actually some of the unintended consequences might be as well. Um, so anybody interested in this, uh, the link to a paper and some of my other papers as well, but I'm finishing now, so we have some time for questions as well. Thank you. And thank you, Pierre. Um, that was all very informative presentations by all four, and uh, and it's generated a great deal of discussion and several questions that may require answers on camera in the chat. So at this stage, I'd like to bring in Nick Scott with the first question. Hi, sir. <clears throat> Hi Simon, thank you. Um, could I ask the experts for their view uh, as to the quality of the advice provided by agents? Um, clearly, students could, prospective students could apply directly to universities in most cases. Um, so what's your assessment of the quality of the advice that agents give to prospective students over and above that information that they could find 
on other channels such as the university's websites or um, or social media, for example. Thank you. I can maybe say a few words uh, as well. I guess, you know, we have so many different types of agents, different quality agents. So it's very difficult to say that there's uh, some kind of a consistent. Um, I think there are agents that do a superb job and provide a lot of added value. And that's obviously the reason a lot of students um, and families would decide to use agents as well. Um, but then obviously we have the other end where you'd probably um, you know, the value might be very limited or might actually be uh, negative as well if you're being, being misled. Um, I actually used to work as an education agent um, before my, my academic roles. And um, I think for a lot of students, there was the issue of too much information. You needed somebody to kind of help you to where, where to get started to have an understanding. So even if we have all information online, doesn't necessarily make the decision making process easier. Um, but obviously there's always some bias, especially when, you know, there is commissions involved. Um, and that's something, you know, that the industry should have a more active discussion on. But um, some of my colleagues might have uh, something to add to that as well. Does anyone else want to come in? We do have quite a lot of other questions. Oh, okay. Um, Morton Hansen has the second question. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, two short questions. Can you say anything about the length of these uh, particularly high specificity contracts? So are we talking a couple pages or a lot? Um, do you know any examples of these, age, uh, these contracts being used for a legal dispute? Or do they tend to basically work as a type of mem memorandum of understanding um, or, or does it is it used in sort of a legal sense? Who would like to um, pick that up? Okay, so I can answer part of that question. Um, in terms of the length of the specific contracts, from the 38 contracts we analyzed, the length varies a lot. <laughs> so some can be very short, like uh, two pages, and others can be 20 pages. In terms of whether uh, the universities actually have used the contracts of the terms to hold the agents to account, and that's something uh, we probably need to go um, further in, into, the, into the research. Thank you. Anyone else like to add anything to that? Okay. Our third question is from Berta Guillemot. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, uh, thanks to all of the experts for the excellent presentation. I would like to, uh, to ask if there's any specifics worth mentioning in relation to ASEAN agents. Thank you. Who's going to answer that? I, I don't think there's anything specific to pull out um, about agents based in, in, in Asia. I note that our, our research, that first piece of research was focused on universities. So we haven't surveyed agents. We, we've, looked at, we've looked at agents through the lens of universities. Uh, we've not looked at agents directly and we haven't looked at, at agents through the lens of students. These would both be very interesting areas to explore further. I might want to just add that um, mm -hmm. there are a couple of Asian countries that have uh, also tried to introduce legislation or regulation uh, for students going offshore, um, such as China and so on. But um, they haven't, I guess, been highly, highly successful. And I think they've been relaxing those uh, regulations as well. But again, that's one way forward as well for the country of origin to think about, you know, could we actually somehow uh, improve practices? Uh, within our borders as well. I'll, I'll just I'd just like to briefly share for those who are interested, piggybacking on Petulia's um, comment, uh, Hong Kong and Hong Kong and the Hong Kong Consumer Council has actually done pretty good and interesting work in a study on exactly this, how they can better regulate the agents within Hong Kong so that students and other stakeholders are, are best served. Thanks, Ed. Um, can we bring in Robin Shields now? Robin. 
Hello, everyone. I'm Robin Shields from University of Bristol. That was a great presentation. Thanks, everybody. I wanted to know more about agents as companies. Are they mostly small companies with a few employees or are some of them larger? Are there chains of agents or multinational agents? And is there any investment capital involved? I'm thinking of low fee private schools that have had quite a lot of investment uh, dumped into them recently. Is something similar happening with agents? So perhaps I can kick off because uh, I think when I first started working with agents uh, more than 20 years ago, they were often pretty small outfits, often one person um, outfits, sometimes which I felt was inappropriate and refused to work with them, school counsellors who also uh, worked as agents. I thought that was unethical, but I know that UK universities do contract with uh, agents that are also school counsellors work within a school or school teachers. And I think there was a very low barrier to entry um, to becoming an agent. I think that has changed um, hugely. I noticed that somebody's asked a question about the rise of super agents or agent aggregators. Um, I'm sure people will have seen that Apply Board recently received funding of $70 million in um, Series B funding. Agents are now respectable organisations. The uh, uh, UK universities or former UK universities minister is the chairman of Apply Board. The UK government's um, uh, um, international champion is an advisor to Apply Board. Um, agents are now respectable. The world has changed a lot in 20 years and we have a huge variety of types of agents, multinational agents, agents located in the domestic country, um, in the supply country. Um, uh, uh, I think it's very, it's very difficult to describe a, an agent as one um, in one form. I guess you still have the diversity as well. So you have people, you know, who just have a mobile phone and they're an agent. Um, and then you'd have, you know, uh, agents like IDP, which are actually bigger than a lot of the institutions they work with. So it, obviously the power contract is very different as well. If you operate with an entity that's much bigger than your educational institution, how do you control and monitor somebody and try to enforce your, your contract terms? So again, the diversity is quite, yeah. Um, um, bubbling, yeah. Anyone, anyone else on the structure of the industry? Okay. Um, Marco Turk, are you there? Hello, Marco. No, maybe not. Phil, Phil Altback, if you're ready to ask your question, can you come in now, please? Sure. Um, thank you, Simon. Uh, and very interesting uh, uh, program. I had a sort of broader philosophical question, and that is, is it fair to say that the entire agent system um, doesn't really represent the interest of students, but entirely the interest of the universities who hire the agents? Mm, who would like that one? Um, yeah, I mean, I have obviously read some of your work as well and, and discussions um, on that. And obviously, uh, when the relationship is between a provider um, and um, the, universe, the provider and the agent, obviously, the best interests uh, you would think are with um, thinking about that university and um, agent relationship rather than the student. But when you actually go and talk to high quality agents, it's actually uh, the first thing they say is that they are trying to serve the student's best interest because it's in their long-term sustainable business interest as well. Um, but that can probably be debated quite quite a long time, uh, you know, where, but yeah. So when you, when, you, when you talk to specific agents, it's quite clear how the student's interest for them is, is the key thing. And they say, well, the provider might ask me to do A, B, and C, D, but if it's not in the student's best interest, then I might decide to do something else. So I think it's, it's very complex um, as well, but it's a good question and something we also need much more discussion on, you know, where the best interests actually lie. But maybe um, Eddie or Iona or uh, Enzo wanna add to that as well. Yep. Can, I, can I make two comments? Um, I think, you know, the first one is that this is why I think it's incredibly important that there is greater transparency in the way universities work with agents. So students that use agents have an understanding of, um, of the kind of dynamics at play. 
So if we can make clear um, the, what the role of agents are, and importantly, that agents are paid a fee, then a, stu a student might understand, well, why is the agent pushing that university over another university? And let's be honest, it, it's common practice in, in other professional fields to have that, to have that level of transparency. Um, my, my second comment is that I think the world of agents has changed such a lot in the last 20 or so years. So, you know, again, when I first started working with agents, you might have a small agent representing five or 10 universities, and clearly they would have a strong incentive for pushing those five or 10 universities over any other. I think what's changed today now with, um, with large agents and the emergence of super agents is that they typically represent universities in a number of countries, so they're able to give advice on the differences between different, um, different destination countries and often represent a very large number of universities in each of those countries rather than just a small group. Um, I think it's important um, that universities survey their, their students each year, those that are recruited through agents, and understand what level of service and support they have had. Of course, that only deals with those students that were successfully recruited by that agent and doesn't deal with, with those that perhaps had a bad experience and didn't join you. Anything further on that uh, important question? Okay. Uh, I'd like to bring in Cassie Yang at this stage. Jang at this stage. Are you there? Cassie. Hello, Cassie. Hey. Laura. Ah, there she is. Good. Sorry. Thank you so much for the presentation. Very informative and uh, insightful presentation. And I have two questions. Um, the first one is about the typology of the agency contract. Uh, I read a paper uh, written by um, uh, Luna, if I pronounce your name correctly. <laughs> Iona. <laughs> Iona, sorry. And uh, I wondered, um, I wrote uh, one of your paper talk about the typology of university, uh, like all typology of higher education institutions. And I wonder, does those two typologies are like related, your findings are related in some ways? And the second question, oh, yes, please. It's okay, you, you uh, finish your question. Yeah, and my second question actually is more about the relevant uh, regulatory environment in the UK. Um, I wonder what, ca uh, what kind of the role the British Council play uh, in this process or in the market. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very good question. So the first paper we published in Studies in Higher Education was based on the UK universities. So we interviewed um, international directors and uh, senior managers. And so the typology we did there, actually there were similarities, you are absolutely right. So we actually borrowed the terms from there, uh, for example, flexible friends. <laughs> so, um, so yes, uh, so they, they are similar, but there are also differences there. And in terms of the UK, the British Council has uh, actually played a very active role in my view um, in training agents. Um, if you are familiar with their training programs and they have got a list of um, trained and approved agents. Um, so that's really important. Uh, Enzo may be able to tell you a bit more about the UK's general framework. And I mean, um, so we have got this code of uh, practice as well. Um, so London Statement, uh, if you are familiar with that. So Enzo, would you like to add a bit more on that? So I think um, Eddie's also mentioned the London Statement. My, my problem with the London Statement is that it, it, it almost um, suggests that universities should abrogate their responsibilities to agents by putting all of the onus on agent behaviour. And I think my interest is very much in, um, um, in universities' responsibilities. Um, the QAA here in the UK, the Quality Assurance Agency, does give um, guidance, it's, it's guidance only on, on the use of agents, and um, suggests that universities make an up-to-date up list of their appointed agents publicly available. Um, it's worth saying that in the last few months I've reviewed some UK university websites and found them to be out of date, I found them to 
list agents that no longer exist. I found them to list agents with no contact details or dead contact details. The QAA statement also um, advises that universities make clear to students that agents offer a recruitment service for which they are paid by providers. Um, I think very few universities do this. I'm only aware of one university, that was the University of Nottingham up to 2014, which went through a phase when I was director of making clear not only that agents were paid, but also said on our website how much the fee was that we paid to agents. Um, I've not seen anything as clear as that um, since, since, since that was up. It's also worth saying that the Office for Students here in the UK was undertaking a review of admissions, including looking at transparency in the admissions process. I believe that their, that their review has been suspended, but um, I know that they were looking at the role of agents in international student recruitment because um, I responded to them, but uh, I don't know where that's got to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian, so, and thanks for the question. It was great. Um, Marco Turk um, has his microphone back, but I think Laura Spencer is next and we'll have Marco after that. Uh, Laura, are you there, please? I am. Thank you very much. It was only just a quick point, and, and Enzo, you've touched on it already, really. It was about the um, changing dynamics, really, between institutions and their agent network, um, particularly where you have these um, you know, super agents. Um, we seem to be, you know, the potential to lose that direct connection with some of the smaller agents that actually were, were really very good. Um, that's just something I've observed, and I wondered if you had any thoughts and and generally what your, your thoughts are on that. So I share, I share that concern. I mean, you know, in a sense, an agent is already a barrier between direct communication or a facilitator of direct communication with the prospective student. I think once you add in the super agent and the um, and sub agents, then that journey becomes a longer one. And um, an hour, if I pretend that I'm still in a university, our contact with students becomes more distant. It's worth saying when Eddie and I were discussing this um, a few weeks back that he reminded me that in a sense super agents have always existed, predominantly in the Chinese context, mm. where, there, where there are large agents with a huge number of sub-agents. I think what's changed, particularly during the last six months, um, um, and have been encouraged by kind of what's happening uh, with, with COVID, is the growth of these online super agents and regionally based. I'm aware of super agents covering the Middle East, Australia based super agents, supply board based in, in Canada. Um, so I, I and, and I think large traditional agents in a single country are now looking at how they can compete with the super agents and developing their own network of sub agents and their own online support for both universities and students in that recruitment process. Mm. Well, thanks to you all for what's been an excellent discussion. We've got time for a couple more, I think. We usually creep just past the hour. Um, Marco Turk, you've got your microphone back. Would yeah. you like to ask your question? Yes. First of all, thank you. Thank you for interesting presentations and exposures. Uh, Marco Turk, I'm professor of higher education pedagogy. Uh, I want to point out this out from a bit rhetorical perspective. Um, if we are basing uh, our discussion on the premise that one of the global issues of higher education is the commercialization, which has been affected with the higher education system for the ages. Uh, may we emphasize that the idea of educational agents is something which supports even more encourages the strength of commercialization of the higher education in, in whole. As I said, more as a, as a rhetorical question for, for further dis discussion, thank you. I mean, my, my response to that is, is that there's no, it's, there's, there's no doubt that agents are a response to the marketization of, of higher education, but that's not to say that agents don't play an important and helpful role also for, for the students. So we, I don't think we can negate um, the positive impacts that agents have as, as well. But yeah, I, I, I agree that agents have appeared because of the marketization of higher education, sure. We've got time for one from Emma. Emma Tayu. Hello. Hi, thank you, um, Simon. Yeah, so I 
I recently came across the, the ownership structure of IDP and thought that it was fascinating, given that it was actually set up originally by 38 Australian universities and later was listed and 50% is now owned by SEEK and the other 50% is still owned by these Australian universities. So mm. I did wonder whether that views the number of students traveling to Australian universities that would use an agent because I would imagine those universities are more proactively signposting them to use IDP or whether in your research you found that actually whether it's IDP or whether it's an independently owned agent there's actually no difference at all so that that was something that I thought you know was quite interesting to observe and might be worth looking at um, you know just to see whether there's any best practice that they have that might be worth looking at um, or whether yeah it just so happens that they're owned by universities. I wonder if Iona might comment on the number of agents used in different countries and that might in part answer your, your question but not specifically about IDP. Yeah, so first of all, our um, uh, research is about institutional approach to agents. So therefore, it's not about university with any individual agents. So that's one. But in terms of the number of agents, yes, there are differences. Um, so, for example, Australia, the median um, uh, number was actually 201. And then the UK's median was 80 and the US was 25. Um, so, so therefore, the, the number of agents would probably um, be different anyway. And, but in terms of the, the super agents, and so that is one of the areas, actually, we, uh, one of the um, aspects we asked is about whether universities would allow using sub-agents when you get the, the super agents, that's, that's the, the issue which may come through. Um, but as I said, it's mainly because we didn't really look at individual agency relationship, but we just looked at the overall institutional approach. Yeah, of course. I think it's, it's just very interesting when universities have a financial interest in the agents as well. Yeah. Colleagues, I think we'll have to move to a close, but I'd like um, our four speakers to have the opportunity to say something at the very end of what has been a really informative and thoughtful session. Um, can I ask you to consider the future? Um, the Economist has a cover story saying the light is at the end of the tunnel. The vaccine is on the horizon, if not closer. Um, we maybe have a year to run before we uh, are back to the potential for normal operation. But the big question is how does international student mobility bounce back, bounce back how quickly and where does it bounce back and so on. What constructive role can agents play in the regeneration of the market, which they, of course, have an interest in uh, as much as anyone else has. Can I ask you to close then and perhaps go in the order we, we started in, which is Enzo first. Well, there's, there's huge pent up demand for international mobility. We know that, for example, by the number of students taking IELTS in, in, key, um, in key countries like China and, um, and India. Um, and it's clear also that agents are playing a very important role um, in advising prospective students um, on their journey, particularly now that, um, that universities are finding it or, or are unable to travel and meet students face to face. So although technology like this is proving incredibly, incredibly useful, um, parents often want to speak to somebody in their own country, want to speak to somebody in their own language, and I think agents are fulfilling that role. I'm much more optimistic than you are, Simon, about the turnaround um, in, in the market and when we will see international students reaching um, uh, last year's level and accelerating again. Um, and um, there's an article in uh, World University News that uh, Janet Idiev and I wrote, um, I think back in March or April on this topic. So please look at that, thanks. Thanks, Enzo, and thanks for today. Um, uh, Iona. Okay, so I agree uh, with Enzo that agents will uh, basically play a bigger role in an increasing role with this um, pandemic um, impact on the on the market and 
one of the areas I think that we haven't touched on is agents' role in actually being a bridge between universities and their partner universities in other countries. So very often they actually uh, help bring the universities together. They play a very important role in maintaining the relationship with the, uh, uh, with the partner institutions. And so with the difficulty of traveling, and I actually feel it is probably becoming more and more important um, for them to be treated as partners when institutions consider the local market access and local collaboration and local delivery. Thanks, Anna. Eddie? Yeah, I would just add that uh, I think in the future, the near and more distant future, you're going to see so much complexity with respect to different countries' rules and regulations on inbound international travel, different institutional requirements in terms of quarantine, how long, if at all, et cetera. And you'll see agents have to play probably an increasingly uh, important clarifying role in working with their students as to if you go to this country and this institution, here's the type of quarantine situation you'll be looking at. If you go here, it might be this way differently. So I think that gets back to a very good question earlier about the, the integrity and nature of the advice that agents uh, provide. And I think that will become that much more important. The other point I would just kind of end with, I'm kind of responding uh, again to uh, Dr. Alpak and uh, Marco Turk. I think those points about commercialization and uh, educational institutional interests vis-a-vis -vis students' interests are well made. And in our research, uh, among other things, we call for more research to be done into the student experience in working with agents. And so student contracts with agents, recruitment agents, student contracts with individual uh, independent educational consultants, as we call them here in the United States. And I think the more research is done in, in that uh, arena, um, the better we as a collective field can mitigate the worst of the impacts. Thanks, Ed. Um, you have the final word, Pierre. At 4 a.m., you're entitled to it. Pierre. Yeah, so I also, um, you know, emphasize the mutual relationships and um, actually agents during um, the pandemic have played a very important role as well, helping students stock um, overseas or in their own countries um, and the type of information that providers haven't necessarily been able to to give students but really emphasizes the importance of, of agents actually helping students as well. Um, and universities and other institutions would be also wise to to really uh, nurture those relationships during the pandemic as well, even if you know student numbers might take a while to to keep back getting back to normal or growing again, um, and not just kind of forgetting them as, as as somebody that we have a contract with, but really thinking about long term uh, strategic partnering and relationship with the agent agent network and being a bit using this time to be a bit wiser who they work with having robust uh, practices um, in place as well. Mm -hmm. So so that's hopefully, and I mean, I we will probably see agents disappearing um, the longer the situation goes on at the moment. So there will be agents that are financially struggling as well. Um, so I guess we will see um, in a year or so, two years time, you know, what the uh, industry will look like. Um, but there also has been some interesting innovations going on. For example, Education New Zealand has been very active in organizing webinars for agents every, I think um, even once a week or a few times that they didn't use to do. So there are different ways of communicating now with these partners, which uh, can be very useful in the future as well. So um, I guess we will again see in a few years time which direction we're moving. Thank you. Thanks, wise words, Pierre. And, um... It's a tribute to this topic and these speakers that we've held such a large audience for a long time, rather past our past our normal shutdown. Um, colleagues, uh, Enzo and colleagues, you might want to remember that Thomas Hale asked a question late, which we didn't get a chance to discuss, and that is well worth responding to. Um, well, thank you very, very much, and I think that you know you've shown the the importance of a research based approach to to current practice and how how that can really strengthen our grasp of what we need to do, and what is going on. Um, can I invite you all to return to the CG webinar 
tomorrow where we're going to discuss um, university research capacity in post-Soviet countries and the discussion will be led by Mayor Chancelliani, my colleague at Oxford. Look forward to seeing you all again then and we look forward to a further discussion of international education sometime soon in the future. Bye for now.